The Expanse is a multi-part space opera that spans many books and many seasons. I absolutely love it. The authors and scriptwriters have taken the trouble to represent the physical realities. A gravity-like field is only present when under thrust. Otherwise, magnetic boots hold you to the floor. Spaces are small and fragile, resources are finite, and the environment must be carefully managed to sustain life. In The Expanse, we also encounter gunfights. Lots of gunfights. Whilst I'm trying to enjoy this space western blazing before me, I'm not concentrating at all. How do the guns work? Now, the obvious problem is discharging a firearm in zero G, but there's more, much more, which the novels and show do go some way to answering. But let's use this as a starting point to dig just a little deeper. And we'll dig using tools from a concept development exercise. An early concept development exercise doesn't offer answers, it offers questions. Think of it as an investigator. Next clue to the case. How did we get here? We reach out, and reach out, and flipping and flipping the switches like a goddamn monkey to see if something clicks. Huh? Now where I come from, we call that a clue. At first, there are too many dots, so we need to add some lines. Ultimately, we hand those connections to the lab, and the lab tells us whether these connections can be physically realized. A well-formed but early concept is a hypothesis, a rhetorical argument as yet unsupported by a technical foundation. The concept is a framework of questions, not the answer. The lab provides the answers. We consider the value proposition for a gun to be used in a space habitat. Shooting people whilst on a space habitat comes at a price. If you fire a gun whilst not fixed to the floor, then you're going to have trouble with your aim. Trouble maintaining your position and trouble with your tactics. Firing a contemporary terrestrial gun releases toxic gases and perhaps also a lead dust residue that could present a hazard to the recycled environment of a long-term habitat. Finally, a weapon that can penetrate a human target can penetrate the wider environment which supports life. If you harden the environment, the target can harden just as easily. Body armor and the hull of the environment both suffer the same design pressure. They must both be as light as possible whilst resisting kinetic energies. Whatever you armor the environment with, the target can use to armor itself. More formally, this problem looks like this. If you employ kinetic energy as your damage mechanism, this mechanism can be resisted with armor which absorbs the kinetic energy of the bullet. If you increase the kinetic energy of the bullet, you are more likely to damage the wider environment. The gas pressure within a traditional gun barrel will introduce kinetic energy to the bullet. However, without a firm foundation, this energy exchange will also move the operator, which may be undesirable. Furthermore, the product of a gun designed for the terrestrial space may introduce toxic materials into the closed and recycled environment of a spacecraft. You could mitigate this toxicity and the loss of air pressure by simply wearing a suitable environmental support. Don't forget that these toxins and a loss of pressure will harm any unprotected residents. If they're not your target, this is a problem. Further clothing could mitigate problems introduced by a lack of firm footing through magnetic boots. However, be aware that this footing demands that the floor be magnetic. And if you're fighting on someone else's turf, then they have control of that flooring. A contemporary firearm therefore employs two primary benefits that introduce harms that must be mitigated in our problem space. The kinetic energy of the round and the gases that offer that kinetic energy. The obvious solution to this problem is not to care. With magnetic boots to fix you to the spot, it seems likely that some stance can be adopted to manage the recoil of a firearm. With a self-contained environment suit, then you're free to poke holes in the hull and suffocate or poison every unprotected crew member as you please. Job done. This might be fine in an all-out assault within an opposition environment, but the opposition may own the floor, and now the control of your weapon and your position is controlled by the opposition. And what if you're defending your own ship? Or at least want to capture the opposition environment intact? This may be, after all, why you've boarded this vessel. Otherwise, you could employ a more conclusive means to defeat the opposition. The investigator asks a question. The investigator reaches out. Can we offer a more elegant solution? I'm 
just flipping switches, you know, seeing what lights come on, and right now that's a switch I can't flip. We might suggest a non-toxic, recoilless hand weapon that somehow not only employs high power to penetrate armor, but is simultaneously sufficiently low power not to penetrate the surrounding environment. How do we make this leap from one side of the value proposition to the other? What tools can we employ to suggest a suitable concept? What tools does the investigator possess to ask the right questions? To start, we can simply list our objectives. We want a kinetic damage mechanism using a non-toxic recoilless propellant that can penetrate armor whilst not penetrating the wider environment. If a problem is defined by the contradiction of two desirable benefits, then which of these desires cannot coexist? We cross-reference all of our desires to define our problem and discover only two significant contradictions from which a traditional firearm might suffer in a space habitat. As the penetration of our round increases, the more recoil we must absorb. As the penetration of the round increases, the more likely the round will penetrate the environmental hull. Everything else is up for grabs. Let's start with the easiest contradiction. Let's ask a good question. Can we propel a bullet without imposing any recoil onto the shooter? This is easy. In the Expanse universe, the authors offer two solutions, and both solutions are well within the reach of even contemporary technologies. The gyrojet rocket pistol was designed by MB Associate in 1964 and packed a punch. The powerful rocket of the gyrojet was able to build up considerable kinetic energy at long ranges. The Martian space marines in the Expanse universe possess this technology. Alternatively, recoilless guns are also well understood. We expend some of the weapon's energy to mitigate the recoil. We project our bullet forward, whilst counteracting momentum transfer by ejecting some portion of the gas pressure backwards through a nozzle. In the Expanse narrative, the Martian pistol employs this mechanism. In the context of the show, the weapons are designed to fire both self-propelled rounds and traditional cartridge rounds. The rear of the barrel is vented at the back to eliminate recoil for use in zero-g situations. However, considering the speed of gas required to counteract the impulse of launching a bullet, how one aims this pistol without receiving a jet of hot gas in the face will require some careful management. We have two options in the story and one question. Which of these arrangements gives us everything we want? These arrangements might resolve the recoil problem, but do not resolve the toxic problem. Both may still eject toxic gases to propel the round. The investigator asks another question. How might this harm be resolved? I wonder what that rain tastes like. I used to love the rain when I was a kid. I used to sit out here and watch the lightning storms. That sounds beautiful. Of the 76 standard solutions with which we might resolve a harm, Consider section 5.1, indirect methods for introducing substances under restricted conditions, and we can certainly treat our self-contained environment as a restricted condition. Moving into subsection 5.1.3, indirectly achieve a function by introducing a substance that disappears after carrying out its work, or becomes identical to substances already in the system or environment. The investigator asks another question. What substances can we find in our environment? Dry air contains 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and small amounts of carbon dioxide and other gases. Air also contains a variable amount of water vapor, which the space habitat must therefore be able to manage. We could propel a rocket with compressed air. To maximize performance and penetrate that armor, we need the power of chemistry. What vigorous chemistry will produce any of the substances found in air? Hey, I got you this far, kid. The rest is up to you. Water. Right, it's just water. It doesn't really taste like anything. A reaction between hydrogen and oxygen might offer sufficient energy. Alternatively, high test peroxide decomposes into a high temperature mixture of steam and oxygen. Other chemistries may be available that also decompose to the constituents of air. Now we have a question, and this is one for the lab. 
What is the most vigorous chemical reaction that decomposes to only water or nitrogen? Can we use this chemistry to prepare a lethal bullet? A steam rocket seems to offer a good solution. The gyrojet of 1964 could pack a punch at long range once the rocket round had picked up speed. The rocket round therefore offers a suitable damage mechanism at the long range one might encounter in the zero drag spaces outside the enclosed habitat. If we need a high speed round that delivers a great deal of kinetic energy at long range, the rocket round offers the performance that we need. However, the engagements within the closed spaces of the Expanse universe seem to take place at very short range indeed. For our particular needs, we also demand good short range performance. At very short range, the gyrojet rocket round has not yet built up enough energy to harm much at all. Our rocket round manages our recoil, but at short ranges our kinetic energy damage mechanism is lost. By resolving the recoil contradiction with a rocket, we've lost the primary function of the weapon at short range. This suggests that our recoilless option is superior in the close spaces of environmental habitats. Both solutions introduce a significant problem. If either bullet misses the target, the kinetic damage mechanism will carry on to penetrate the wider environment. Yeah. yeah that could be a problem. You might want to look into that. Another question. How do we prevent this? The rocket rounds or recoilless guns in the Expanse universe design us into a corner. But this is a good thing. This is when we break out of the box. This is not the moment when we offer the right answer. This is the moment that forces us to ask the right questions. You're sure you can do that without killing us all? No. The contemporary terrestrial pistol that we have used as our starting point uses kinetic energy as the damage mechanism. But what type of damage mechanism does not depend on the speed of the round? What? Something like a billion year old unexploded bomb? Yeah, something like that. A detonation exhibits this property. This damage mechanism is not dependent upon the projectile velocity to inflict damage, but instead generates a damage mechanism only once the round has successfully reached the target. We need an explosive round that damages with a gaseous shockwave or is sure to drive a kinetic penetrator into the target. An explosive once more introduces toxic gases into the environment. We return to the lab and ask another question. What is the most vigorous chemical reaction that decomposes to only water or nitrogen? How do we detonate this to harm the target? The recoilless round will have to incorporate this warhead into its structure and carry it to the target. The rocket round has this chemistry incorporated into the motor. Once the rocket round has reached the target, could all of the remaining propellant be consumed simultaneously to offer a suitable detonation? In both cases, if the same chemistry serves to not only propel the round, but also offers an explosive warhead, then we can suggest some elegant options. Consider the rocket round. The chemical rocket offers a multifunctional component. The rocket can either transform all of its chemistry into a high-speed round to defeat targets at the long ranges outside the closed environment. Alternatively, this rocket could conserve some of its chemistry to fly slower inside the vulnerable habitat and defeat the target with an explosive warhead fueled by the remaining propellant. The recoilless round could also offer a similar option. As the recoilless round leaves its propulsive mechanism behind, some decisions will need to be made when we pull the trigger. In long-range engagements, all of the propellant could be consumed at launch. This would offer a high-speed kinetic round that could reach its target quickly and deliver a powerful punch. Alternatively, at short ranges within the vulnerable structures, only part of this propellant could be consumed to launch the round offering a slower delivery mechanism that carries the remaining chemistry to the target to act as an explosive warhead. Two solutions, different mechanisms, but similar results. Whichever mechanism can be practically realized, then the round need not travel quickly to harm the target at short ranges. The warhead offers this function. In fact, the slower this round travels, the less likely it is to penetrate the hull of the environment. However, we may have slowed down the projectile, but the damaging detonation still reaches our ship hull if we miss the target. Uh, fuck. Uh. We're not out of the woods yet. We ask yet another question. Exploring the case. How can we deactivate that warhead should we miss the target? Can we create a simple filter that will discriminate between things that are the target and things that are not? 
Well, there are lots of different methods to discriminate between the target and the hull. For the sake of argument, let's choose a simple one. The structures that contain the habitable environment are always further away than the target. We momentarily measure the distance between the weapon and the target before we fire the weapon. If our round travels further than this range, then we can simply deactivate that warhead. As both options carry a warhead, both can be deactivated should the target not be hit. As both options carry a warhead made from propellant, we can offer an additional trick. The rocket carries its propellant with it, and we would prefer to consume all of the propellant before we discard the round. Can we use the remaining propellant to stop the round should we miss? Can we reverse our thrust? The rocket round then becomes a tiny spacecraft in its own right. The recoilless round is not helpless once it's on its way. It also carries some chemistry in the warhead. Could the recoilless round also employ this chemistry to dump energy once it has missed the target? By proposing chemistries that offer both propulsion and detonation, we ultimately propose a single gas generation mechanism to resolve multiple problems. Propelling the round, damaging the target, slowing the round and protecting the hull. A single mechanism to offer multiple functions is the essence of elegance. A rhetorical argument exists to suggest that both the rocket round and the recoilless weapon could offer this elegance. So there we have it a non-toxic firearm that can be employed in zero-g, that can discriminate between the target and the safety-critical environment that surrounds it, and employs an explosive damage mechanism that can stop the bullet should we miss. We have dislocated the connection between harming the target and harming the surrounding environment. We can now increase the power of the detonation to penetrate the target, whilst minimising further harm to that environment. But don't be fooled into thinking that these concepts are designs. They are not. The investigator asks questions and is making some bold claims on the potential capabilities of simple chemistries. A bold claim is not a design, it's a hypothesis that requires testing. This is the role of the investigator, to ask questions, to make bold claims, to offer hypotheses to test and offer a starting point for the hard, practical work of science and engineering. And if the lab says no, we literally return back to the drawing board and take another try. The investigator reaches out and reaches out and reaches out. At first there are too many dots, and so we add some lines. We offer those connections to the lab, and then we reach out, and we reach out, and we reach out, and we reach out, and we reach out.